Chapter 6 It was cold on Haggis Hill and fresh with furrows where the dragging points of stars had plowed the fields. A peasant in a purple smock socked the smoking furrow sowing seeds. There was a smell, the Gallics thought, a little like forever in the air, but mixed with something faint and less enduring, possibly the fragrance of a flower. There's no light in her window, the Gallic said, and it is dark and getting darker. There is no smoke in her chimney, said the prince, and it is cold and getting colder. The Gallics barely breathed and said, What worries me the most is that spider's web there on the door that stretches from the hinges to the latch. The young prince felt a hollow feeling in his zatch. Knock on her door, the Gallic said, his voice so high it quavered. He crossed his fingers and kept them crossed, and Zorn knocked on the door. No one answered. Knock again, the Gallics cried, and Prince Zorn knocked again. Haga was there. She came to the door and stared at them, a woman neither dead nor dying, and clearly only thirty-eight or thirty-nine. The Gallics had missed her age by fifty years, as old men often do. Weep for us, the Gallics cried, or else this prince will never wed his princess. I have no tears, said Haga. Once I wept when ships were overdue, or brooks ran dry, or tangerines were overripe, or sheep got something in their eye. I weep no more, said Haga. Her eyes were dry as deserts, and her mouth seemed made of stone. I've turned a thousand persons gemless from my door. Come in, she said. I weep no more. The room was dark and held a table and a chair, and in one corner something like a chest made of oak and bound with brass. The Gallic smiled and then looked sad and said, I have tales to make a hangman weep, and tales to bring a tear of sorrow to a monster's eye. I have tales that would disturb a dragon's sleep, and even make the total sigh. At the mention of the total, Haga's hair turned gray. I once wept when maids were married underneath the April moon. I weep no more when maids are buried, even in the month of June. You have the emotions of a fish said the Gallics irritably. He sat on the floor and told her tales of the death of kings, of kindred things and little children choked by rings. I have no tears, said Haga. He told her tales of the frogs in the forum and the toads in the rice that destroyed the poppy cockalorum and the cockapupatrice. I weep no more, said Haga. Look, the Gallic said, and listen. The Princess Saralinda will never wed this youth until the day he lays a thousand jewels upon a certain table. I would weep for Saralinda, Haga sighed, if I were able. The prince had wandered to the oaken chest. He seized its cover with his hand and threw it open. A radiance filled the room and lit the darkest corners. Inside the chest were at least ten thousand jewels of the very sort and kind the duke demanded. Diamonds flared and rubies glowed and sapphires burned and emeralds seemed on fire. They looked at Haga. Oh, these are the jewels of laughter, Haga said. I woke up fourteen days ago to find them on my bed. I had laughed until I had wept at something in my sleep. The Gallics grabbed a gleaming handful of the gems and then another, crowing with delight. Put them back, said Haga, for there's a thing that you must know concerning jewels of laughter. They always turn again to tears a fortnight after. It has been a fortnight to the day and minute since I took the pretties to this chest and put them in it. Even as they watched, the light and color died. The diamonds dimmed, the emeralds went out, and the jewels of Haggis laughter turned to tears with a little sound like sighing. There was nothing in the chest but limpid liquid leering up at them and winking. You must think, the Gallics cried. You must think of what you laughed at in your sleep. Haga's eyes were blank. I do not know, for this was fourteen days ago. Think, the Gallics said. Think, said Zorn of Zorna. Haga frowned and said, I can never remember dreams. The Gallics clasped his hands behind his back and thought it over. As I remember and recall, he said, the jewels of sorrow last forever. Such was the gift and power the good Gwain gave you. What was he doing, by the way, so many leagues from Yarrow? 
hunting. Haga said, wolves, as I recall it. The Gallic scowled. I'm a man of logic in my way. What happened on that awful day to make him value sorrow over and above the gift of laughter? Why have these jewels turned to tears fortnight after? There was a farmer from a nearby farm who laughed, said Haga. On second thought, the good king said, I will amend and modify the gift I gave you. The jewels of sorrow will last beyond all measure, but may the jewels of laughter give you little pleasure. The Gallics groaned. If there's one thing in the world I hate, he said, it is amendments. His eyes turned bright and brighter, and he clapped his hands. I will make her laugh until she weeps, he said. The Gallics told her funny tales of things that were and had been, but Haga's eyes were dry as quartz, and her mouth seemed made of agate. I laugh at nothing that has been, she said, or is. The Gallic smiled. Then we will think of things that will be and aren't now, or ever were. I'll think of something. And he thought, and thought of something. A dehoy who was terribly hobble cast only stones that were cobble, and bats that were ding from a shot that was sling but never hit inks that were bobble. Haga laughed until she wept, and seven moonstones trickled down her cheeks and clattered on the floor. Oh, she's weeping semi-precious stones, the Gallics wailed. He tried again. There was an old coddle, so mold, molly. He talked in a glot that was Polly. His gauze were so goo that his laps became dew, and he ate only pops that were lolly. Haga laughed until she wept, and seven brilliance trickled down her cheek and clattered on the floor. Rhinestones, groaned the Gallics. Now she's weeping costume jewelry. The young prince tried his hand at telling tales of laughter, but for his pains he got a shower of tourmaline, a cat's eye, and a flux of pearls. The duke hates pearls, the Gallics moaned. He thinks they're made by fish. It grew darker in the room, and they could scarcely see. The starlight and the moon were gone. They stood there, still as statues. The Gallics cleared his throat. The prince uncrossed his arms and crossed them, and then... Without a rhyme or reason, out of time and out of season, Haga laughed and kept on laughing. No one had said a word. No one had told a tale. It might have been the hooting of an owl. It might have been the crawling of a snail. But Haga laughed and kept on laughing, and precious jewels twinkled down her cheeks and sparkled on the floor until the hut was ankle-deep in diamonds and in rubies. The Gallics counted out a thousand and put them in a velvet sack that he had brought along. I wish that she had laughed, he sighed. It's something I had said. Zorn of Zorna took her hand. God keep you warm in winter, said the prince, and cool in summer. Farewell, the Gallic said, and thank you. Haga laughed and kept on laughing, and sapphires burned upon the floor and lit the Gallics toward the door. How many hours are left us now? The young prince cried. It's odd, the Gallics muttered to himself. I could have sworn that she had died. This is the only time my stomach ever lied. How many hours are left us now? The prince implored. Haga sat upon the chest and kept on laughing. I should say, the Gallics said, that we have only forty left, but it is downhill all the way. They went out into the moonless night and peered about them in the dark. I think it's this way, the Gallic said, and they went the way that he thought it was. What about the clocks? demanded Zorn. The Gallic exhaled a sorry breath. That's another problem for another hour, he said. Inside the hut, something red and larger than a ruby glowed among the jewels, and Haga picked it up. A rose, she said. Well, they must have dropped it.